Good morning, Red Cedar Church. My name is Wes. For those of you who are visiting today, I want you to know that I love you. More importantly, I want you to know that God loves you. We're going to hear a message today about how God shepherds the heart, how he wants our heart to be just like his. And when we give him our heart, that's what he uses to shepherd us through the mess. With that being said, would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We just do. We just want to bask in that for a moment. We want to adore you. Again, we say we love you. On behalf of this body, we love you. We want to give you our hearts afresh. We want you to take our hearts and make them more like your sons today. God, as we look at the very messy life of David, let that speak to us and give us grace. No matter what mess we find ourselves in, you can still cultivate that heart. No matter when we mess up, it's never too late. You have grace for us. And God, you as the great shepherd will lead us through the mess as you change our heart. In your name we pray. Amen. The sermon's titled, Messy Christmas, David, a man after God's own heart. The main idea is we pursue God's heart to lead us through the mess. Last week and over the next few weeks, we're looking at the genealogy of Matthew, how it starts out, so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so, and and it really takes us a deep dive into who are these people that make up the story who brought about Jesus. Our main scripture for the series is Matthew 1.17. There were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Who is King David? Let me give you a quick summary. King David was the king of Israel. That was with God's holy people in the Old Testament who had a very specific job to bring about the Messiah, the son of God, the son of David. And he became an anointed king, a famous king, and in the New Testament, he was actually called a man after God's own heart. But we quickly realize as we dive into the story of David, it's very messy. Uh, First and second Samuel chronicle his life. There's more verses given to the biography of David, uh, none other than to Jesus. So that story of his is the most detailed story we have of someone's life in the Old Testament. Let me share with you, start at the end, um, some of the last things we hear about David in the New Testament. Acts 13, 22. So this is the New Testament looking back on this great king of Israel. And here's what the Bible, uh, here's how the Bible summarizes his life. After removing Saul, that was the first king of Israel, he made David their king. That's God. God testified concerning him, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to, which defines what it means to be a person after God's own heart, that David was willing to do everything that God wanted him to. So that's a great summary. That's a great text about someone's life. If this was his funeral, his family would stand up and clap. Yes, David was a man after God's own heart. And we find him in the genealogy leading up to Christmas as a main component for us to understand who is Jesus. Why do they call him the son of David? But let's jump into some of the mess of David. First, let's start with his rise. Saul, the first king, had just totally gone gone off the rails, off the track. God was not pleased with his kingship in any way, and he removed the kingdom from Saul, and he gave it to another. He did this by sending the prophet Samuel down to a house um, where Jesse was the father and had a lot of sons. And Samuel was told by God, go down to the house of Jesse, and there you will find the anointed king. So Jesse rounds up all his sons who he thought had potential to be the king. And each time he would bring a son before the prophet and God would speak to the prophet. Nope, not him. Next one, not him. And he got to the end and he was confused because God told him to go down there and he would find the anointed king. 
but they didn't even consider David. David wasn't even invited to the original party. And the prophet, confused, asked, do you have any more sons? He said, yes, this little shepherd boy out there in the field. They called David, and David comes running down as an obedient son. And when the prophet sees him, he knows this is the future king, the future shepherd of God's people, Israel. And when he sees him, he anoints him and pours oil on his head, anointing him to be the next king. And Samuel and all of us learn a perfect and good lesson at this time that God does not look on the outside, but looks inward to the heart. And that is central to the story of David, and that's central to your discipleship. That is central to Christmas, that God is looking to shepherd the heart, and all things flow from that. Well, David would go back out after his anointing, and he would go and return to his regular job. But one day, he was sent by his father, Jesse, to go check on his brothers who were at war with the Philistines. And so David brings a food package, and his father wants a report on how the war is going. So David comes to the battle line, and what he finds is a very scared Israel people who are not willing to fight. There's a giant on the Philistine side called Goliath, and he taunts them daily, like, who will come out and fight on behalf of Israel? And it was kind of a winner-takes-all proposition. If your guy wins, we'll be your slaves. If we win, you will be our slaves, and we will conquer you. And each day, the giant's taunt grew louder and louder as he made his way down into the ravine. David could not believe his ears. How could this non-person of God Detried God's name, devalued God's name, and why wasn't anyone stepping up in the army? David said, I will go and fight with him. People begin to laugh. This little this shepherd boy? The, the, there are men around here who've been in war after war, but yet the shepherd boy will lead us in the victory. Well, we know the story. David goes out and he slays Goliath, and now people start to pay attention to the anointing that is on his life deeply. David experiences a meteor-like rise in his life. He, is, uh, he wins battles. He's put in charge of the army. And, but then something happens. Something bad happens. He becomes king of Israel. And as he becomes king, uh, he does well. He conquers Jerusalem, and he sets up God's place, and he's on his way to setting up the temple of God. But in his midlife, we see him fall from this beautiful rise. The anointed king, the one who defeated Goliath, had become the one true king of Israel who worshiped God with all of his heart. In a midlife crisis, while while his soldiers are out to war, he commits adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. And he brings Bathsheba into his house, and he marries her, and he, he tries to pretend like nothing's wrong. A prophet walks into his house and exposes the sin. David does repent, but we never see David completely return to that former glory. Sin has consequences, and his life takes turn, and there enters the mess of his life. The baby that he had, uh, that Bathsheba had, dies. David lies and murders someone. His children go into complete disarray in every way. Amnon, his one son, lures his sister into the bedroom and dishonors her. Absalom, filled with rage, who is another brother, decides to kill Amnon. And then he goes on a military conspiracy campaign for years towards his father. Absalom would die in battle against David. And we would find David weeping by the gates. Absalom, Absalom, my son, I would have died for thee. Now, friends, that's a messy story. Christmas is all about God entering the mess. And we see that David, adultery, murder, lying, and his family in complete disarray. How does he get to a point where he is called a man after God's own heart? It's because of the grace of Christmas. And I want you to be encouraged today. I want you to listen because God has grace for you. He is still fine-tuning your heart. Your story, much like David, is not over. And God's grace and mercy will have the final words. What does it mean to have a heart like God's? 
The other night, uh, we went to Elliott Scrimmage, and he's playing for Cameron, and they still have three teams combined. They will eventually split those teams up, but they gathered all three teams to play one game, which means a lot of the boys didn't get a lot of playing time. And Kelly and I were sitting there in the bleachers. We were looking across the gym at Elliott, and he was just... He looked different. He looked mad. All the boys were sitting on one side. He was down there sitting on the end by himself. I I whispered to Kelly, like, what's wrong with him? Oh, who knows? It's Elliot. Okay, and so we're we're, we're watching him, and he's doing weird stuff. He's getting a game. He's in the zone, and we watch him play, and we have a great time watching him play. After the game, I began to ask him some questions. Elliot, why were you sitting alone on the end of the bench? He's like, that's why my coach would have to look me in the eyes every time he put someone in. He was trying to punk out the coach for game time, and we saw him. He was staring the coach down. And then I saw another coach try to come encourage him, and Elliot looked off into the distance. I said, were you disrespecting your coach? And he said, no. He asked me if I was all right because the coach saw that he looked kind of weird like his parents saw that he was looking kind of weird across the gym. Elliot went on to say, I told him I'm here to win. And that's all he said to, and he just looked back and he won it in the game. I was like, man, this kid uh, has a different mentality. And I thought for a second, I like that. (laughs) I like the weirdness. I like the competitive nature of his heart. He has a heart like his dad's. It made me happy. Here's the point of today. You have to let God shepherd your heart and change your heart to be like his if we're going to make it through the family disarray, if we're going to make it through the messiness of this world, if we're going to make it through our own temptation, your heart has to be cultivated to be just like Jesus. Let's jump in and learn a few lessons from David's life. One, we pursue God's heart to lead us through the mess by doing all of his will. We've already talked about David and Goliath a little bit. You know when he walked up on that battle, his brothers accused him just to be there to see the war? You come, you have evil in your heart, David. You just want a battle. You just want to see people die. You are here for the gruesomeness of war. He was wrongfully accused. We know in David's heart, he just didn't want God's name dishonored by this Philistine soldier. He had holy motives. He was willing to do anything for God because he was passionate for God in every way. Later on in David's life, when he becomes king, when he settles Jerusalem, what he wants to do more than anything is set up the temple so that God's people have a proper place to worship. My question to you this morning is this. Friends, as you desire to get through this mess we call life, have you given him your whole heart? Are you still holding back pieces? You see, David didn't see life as an a la carte obedience thing. He was willing to obey God in worship. He was willing to obey God in every way. And we see that to have this heart after God's, we must give him all of our heart. Point two, we must pursue God's heart to lead us through the mess by responding with grace. We started off with seeing just how messy David's life was. It's hard to read. It's hard to preach. Some of it feels inappropriate to talk about in a mixed company, in a group. David's life is so messy from the Bible, it is painful. But here's the thing. God knew we were in the mess, and that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to forgive us and give us grace, not so that we could keep sinning, so that he could restore us to a wholeness. David gives us a beautiful on-ramp a way so that we can see we who are sinful, we who have messy lives can receive the grace of God. Remember, I told you he committed adultery. He killed that woman's husband. Sad. We shouldn't gloss over that. But it encourages us because if someone like David can have a heart like God's, so can we. Right after that incident in Psalm 51, He writes his repentance prayer. He begins to interact with God's grace. I want you to think about where you need grace and hear these words from David, the psalmist. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. You see, he's not saying, hey, God, remember, I'm the guy who beat Goliath. I'm the guy who settled Jerusalem. No, God, I am not trusting in anything I do, but I'm trusting in your character, in your love, for my grace. 
according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Friends, we see as David Hart, David's heart is trying to be like God's. He knew that he had to receive grace in the mess. Have you asked God for forgiveness? Have you dialed in that it's about his grace and his love? And not only is it about that, but he wants to cleanse you this morning. He wants to blot out every sin. That is the story of Christmas. Christ Jesus came to forgive our sins. But David did not abuse grace. He still hated sin. And I want you to know that you should let the Bible define what sin is and what sin isn't. If the Bible tells you not to do something or has a code of conduct and has an ethic, God means that and he's serious and that's what he's called his people to live. We are a holy people as we respond to God's grace. But we have to learn to walk in that. We have, as we're going through the mess and God is shepherding our hearts to guide us through the mess, we must be hard on our sin but graceful to others. You see, a lot of people who are hard on themselves are hard on other people. But if you are graceful to yourself, sometimes you're great, you are way graceful to other people. The truth of the matter is, is God doesn't want you spending a whole lot of time on other people's sin altogether. And David would model this well. He would show compassion. He would show grace when other people sin, but he would sit in reflection on his own sin. And so the question this morning is, do you daydream When you think about sin, do you think about what the rest of the world's doing? Do you think about what your family members or your friends are doing? Friend, you should spend more time in judgment on yourself and not of the world. The Bible puts it this way. Remove the plank from your own eye before you remove the speck from your brother or sister's eye. Quit daydreaming about other people's sins and take your sin to the one who is merciful in every way. This help live out one of God's key principles from the Bible is that we should be graceful to our enemies. Remember King Saul, who I told you about? He tried to murder David. Now, again, I think we read stories in the Bible and we don't really take any impact. I want you to go back with me to your last dinner date, whether that was at a restaurant or around your family dinner table. The last time you ate with other people. You with me? Do you have that picture in your head? Okay, imagine a person to the right of you pulls out a weapon and tries to kill you. Kind of a bad time, right? That wasn't the point of the dinner. You were trying to fellowship. Here's David just trying to be a man after God's own heart, and Saul is so jealous, he throws a javelin at him. That's a bad time. And why did Saul do this? Because the ladies in the kingdom started singing songs. David has slain 10,000s, but... Saul has only slain thousands. And like two schoolyard boys, Saul is jealous because they're girls like David and they're not singing songs about him. See, women, men never change, do they? It's still, still about getting a good song from a girl in every way. Praise. Saul pursues him, tries to kill him, tries to turn his best friend against him. And twice, David had Saul within his grasp and he could have ended the king's life. But David gave grace. In this very extreme and messy example, it was David who gave grace to his enemies. When Saul died, he could have finally said, he got what was coming to him. I'm glad he's dead. He's been chasing me around the desert. He's made me hide in caves. David wept for the anointed king of Israel. And I wonder if this morning we could get our hearts around that. If our hearts could be tuned to be like God, if we could let him, let him shepherd us through the mess, maybe we wouldn't carry the bitterness. Maybe we wouldn't have revenge because when you're focused on the revenge of the mess, when you're carrying bitterness through the mess, your heart cannot be cultivated to whom God has called you to be. Do you need to forgive someone this morning? God says, bless those who curse you. And it's not because it's some weird spiritual exercise. God's not trying to make you better than everyone else. He's simply trying to shepherd your heart. If you focus on the enemies, if you focus on what people say about you, if you pay attention to the destruction that they're trying to bring about you, you won't let me shepherd your heart. Friends, give grace to others. Don't gloat when your enemies have a bad 
time. Which brings us to point three of David, another on-ramp that we can see a person after God's own heart. We pursue God's heart to lead us through the mess by worshiping God. You know, in John chapter four, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman and he dropped some knowledge about worship. He said, in the future, when the spirit comes, they will worship me by spirit and in truth. And we see David as the first person to do that. One, we see he's given a spirit. He's a messy worshiper. Psalm 51, again, this is after he committed adultery. He's been busted out and now he's going to God and he's going to worship God as a messy person. Listen to what he writes, speaking to God. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. You see, friends, as we enter into the house of the Lord, And as we think about Christmas and how it can transform our hearts, we need to know that we're a mess. And God is not looking for sacrifice this morning. He's not looking for you to pull up your bootstraps. He's not looking for you to pull off something so he can interact with you. The first step in God healing the heart is for you to come to him in the reality of your life. God, I'm a mess. I need your grace this morning. I need your mercy. You know the thoughts I have. You know where I fall short. You know the wickedness that that I give into at times. God, I wanna be different. The Bible here gives us this promise that God will not despise us. So this messy worshiper brings reality to the situation, but he also keeps God first. Here's another Psalm he writes as he worships. You God or my God, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in a sanctuary and beheld your glory, beheld your power in your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the riches of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. He put God first as he came into the temple with a broken heart. And lastly, remember how we said truth and spirit, David worship according to the law. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the Bible and it's David writing all about God's word. One verse says this, I will rejoice in your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. Friends, when we come to God to worship and we let him change the heart to be like his, we worship him with everything we have. We put him first and we do it according to how he has revealed himself in the Bible. And when you give your heart to him in truth and in spirit, he will shepherd your heart through the mess. Which brings me to my last point. We pursue God's heart to lead us through the mess by loving God's people. One of the main reasons I love David is because you see the purity of his heart towards other people. He loved Israel. He loved the people worshiping. And I just wonder as a church, if we could pause for a moment and let's begin to grade ourselves to meditate on the truth. Do we love God's people like he wants us to? And that starts at the top, elders and staff members. Do you love people? Have you put the significance upon them that Jesus Christ died for them? Do you see what God is trying to do by getting these people through the mess, which means that while they're in the mess and while they're flailing around, that you will treat them with love and mercy and kindness? That you see it as, oh no, it's not them again, it's not their mess, it is God's heart for these people, small group leaders. Think about the people that are on your roster, people you're in charge of. Has your heart broken for them in a way that says you will shepherd them through the mess, that your actions, your words reflect the very heart of God? You see, David wrote in the 23rd Psalm, a very famous Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. 
And David understands his job as shepherd and king. He's not just called for military battle. He is called to lead and shepherd God's people through the mess. He will set up who Jesus is supposed to be as the great king and shepherd of our hearts. In Psalm 23, what does the shepherd do? He protects them. He names them. He keeps them from disease by checking on them, putting salve on them, keeping insects off of them. He feeds them. And you see, and if you understand sheep, you need to know that they need all of that, that they need protected, that they need the insects off of them, they need water and food, and they need to know the wolves aren't going to get them. If you don't provide all of those, guess what happened to the sheep? They'll stay agitated and they won't lie down. They won't rest through the night. They'll wander off. They, they start infighting. God wants to shepherd your heart just like David shepherded his people, just the way the shepherd is outlined, so friends, that you can find rest in a messy world. That the insects of this world will come off of you. The disease of sin will come off of you. You will have water. You will have food so that your soul can lie down beside green pastures and still waters. David was a man pursuing God's heart, and he led the nation to find the rest. He was a man after God's own heart. Now, back to this genealogy. Remember last week we talked about Abraham, David, next week exile, and then we'll, on Christmas we'll talk about the birth of Jesus. Now, what we're going through in this genealogy, I want you to know it's not a sub-point of the Bible. Rather, it is the point of the Bible. Let me walk you through a little history of the Bible so that you can fully enjoy the son of David, who is the shepherd, who is the king, who is a type and shadow, who would represent Jesus Christ, who is the true shepherd and king. You see, the first parents, Adam and Eve, they sinned. The world fell into chaos and the mess entered. The first time the, the gospel is preached in the Bible is Genesis 3.15. God looks at Eve and tells her, you'll have a seed one day. You'll have a descendant who will rise up and crush the head of the serpent. So now every time they have a son, they're like, is this the one who will lead us out of the mess? In Genesis chapter 12, verses one through three, many years later, we find this new person called Abraham and the promise is updated. Uh, Abraham will be a person that will have more descendants than the stars of the sky. And one of these children will take them out of the mess. Then it is updated when we get to the life of David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, David is promised one of his sons, who is Eve's descendants, who is Abraham's descendants, will sit on the throne forever, and he will shepherd God's people. His kingdom will last forever. And so that's one of the main parts of the Bible. Then every time a new king comes in the Old Testament, everybody's wondering, is this the guy? And then he lives for a little while. It's not the guy. His kingdom in it. Then another person comes up. Oh, he's doing good for like four chapters. Boom, he falls down until we get to the birth of Jesus, who is the seed of Eve, who is the promised one from Abraham, who is the son of David, who sits on God's throne and his kingdom will last forever. We pick it up in the gospel of Matthew with this genealogy. But if you fast forward to, I just wanna paint a couple of pictures for you. When Jesus goes riding into the city right before he's crucified, he comes in on a donkey. You know what the people are shouting? Son of David, Hosanna. They are waiting on the update. They think, okay, we found our guy. Here is the Messiah. Here's the one who's going to lead us through the mess, and that's how we read our Bible. That is the story of God, and it's, it's awesome. Jesus silenced the Pharisees because the Pharisees couldn't understand. Okay, so you're David's grandson, but you're also his Lord. It confounded them, and they just could not interact with the Pharisees anymore. Friends, Jesus Christ is the son of David. He walked into the town humbly and low. He gave his all for you so that he could shepherd your heart through the mess and be the great shepherd who gives you rest. Christmas is about our mess, but it's also about Jesus Christ shepherding our hearts through that mess. Would you pray with me? Father, 
The long-awaited king is here. We worship. We are mesmerized by his cleanup redemption process. And we're also mesmerized that he calls us to be a part of it. God, for these people that are here, shepherd their hearts. Get them through the mess. God, we don't glorify David's sin. But we do glorify your mercy towards it. And if David can be a man after your own heart, so can we. His trust was in his great, 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 great grandson. And God, our world's still a mess. But your mercy's still greater. We worship you. We love you. We praise your name for stepping into the mess. God, transform our hearts this morning so you can lead us. So that with our hearts, we can see, we can hear. We can follow you through the mess. We will love your word and stay on its path. That we could worship you with a broken and contrite heart. That we'd be the people who are passionate about your glory and be willing to do all, everything that you have commanded. And God, that we would love your people with all of our hearts. That we'd never judge someone else for the mess. But that we would speak truth and love. And we'd pray that they would receive your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to move into a time of communion, which is very fitting for today. You'll notice there are two stations up front, two stations in the back. Here at Red Cedar Church, we practice open communion. What we mean by that is that if you're a Christian, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and received his grace, you are more than welcome to take communion with us today. If you are not a Christian, we would ask that you would stop and meditate on the beauty of what communion is and that God gave his life on your behalf and think about your own soul and your own heart. Have you given your life to that grace? If at any time during this service, you would feel like you would wanna make a commitment to Christ, you can come forward and someone up front would love to pray with you and you can take your first communion today. What is communion? Communion is when Jesus gathered the ones he loved the most, gathered them in a room and gave some final instructions. He told about his body being broken, about his blood being spilled, and they just couldn't believe it. Because as these people were waiting along, waiting for this anointed king, they had built a different image in their mind. He's gonna come and wreck Rome. He's gonna be a military power. This king is going to take care of all of our problems. He will come riding in on a white horse and here comes humble Jesus on a donkey's foal. Our king will win the war and he will never unsheathe his sword. Our king won through love, through humility, and giving the chance for humanity to be redeemed. So the Bible tells us that we should proclaim his death until he returns. He came as a lamb, he will return as a lion. And we proclaim his death with joy this morning because David gives us an on-ramp on how to be redeemed, but Jesus is God. He did all of the Father's will. There's no messiness to talk about. He offers us grace because we proclaim his death. David loved God's word. Jesus is the word. David shepherded God's people, Israel. Jesus will shepherd the nations. And friend, he's called you today as you take communion. Think about this body that was broken. Think about his blood that was spilled and how that can redeem your broken and contrite heart and give you a heart just like God's.
Jesus is the good news of the kingdom. He is the son of David. And we don't have to wait for the anointed king anymore to shepherd us. We have the Holy One of Israel. So as you come forward or you go back today, grab your communion elements, go back to your seat and take some time to worship and give your heart afresh to God, telling him, God, I want a heart just like yours.